Shall we start? Good morning, friends. It's so wonderful to welcome you to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia for another one of our noontime virtual programs, um, which focus often on architecture, Philadelphia history, uh, design, books, all the things that we love. You should be seeing in your mail very soon our spring brochure. If you are a member, if you're not, you need to become a member so you can get these. Otherwise, you can find out on, online on our website at uh, Athenaeum, philaathenaeum.org and look at events. But our new spring guide has just arrived here at the, at the Athenaeum today. And we have a lot of other wonderful programming um, that is coming up that I hope you will join us for. But today I'm delighted to welcome Jeffrey McCullough, who is the Associate Director for Special Collections and University Archivist at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. He's been talking to us a bit about his, uh, his Philadelphia roots, as well as the time he spent doing research at the library company and HSP for this book that he's going to talk about today. He is widely published everything from a comprehensive anthology of American literature about dogs called In Dogs We Trust, um, to this current book on publishing plates, stereotyping and electrotyping in 19th century US print culture. Over the past 20 years, he has worked in libraries at the University of Illinois, Wesleyan University and the University of South Carolina and is the owner and proprietor of Two Terriers Press, an experimental fine press in Greenville, South Carolina. During the Q&A question, which, which I will moderate after his talk, I invite you to ask him some questions about what it means to own and run an experimental fine press, among other questions that you'll undoubtedly have from his talk. Right now, I invite you to join me in warmly welcoming Jeffrey uh, McCullough to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. Hey, thank you very much for the invitation and for being here. Thank you especially, especially to Tess for helping coordinate all this and getting things going. And thank you, Beth. It's, it's great to be virtually back in Philadelphia here. My, uh, my roots are Northeastern Pennsylvania and uh, I spent a good bit of time in, in Philadelphia institutions on a Reese Fellowship a long time ago now, but it's a quality time at the library company in HSP. So it's, it's great to be back here talking about Philadelphia people, uh, especially Matthew Carey and his influence and um, interesting negotiations of a changing markets place for his, his family Bible trade. So um, I'm gonna share a screen if I would, man, I can. And let's see, we'll start up. Can y'all see that okay? And can you hear me okay? Yep, great, okay, thank you. All right, so um, in 1832, the mathematician, economist, and computing pioneer, Charles Babbage, published a long treatise called On the Economy of Machinery and Manufactures. At the end of an early chapter of his titled On Copying, Babbage invited his readers to consider the printed letter forms that made up the very book that they were reading. The page before them was the final product, he said, of six successful stages of copying. The initial carving of a punch, the creation of a matrix, the casting of type from the matrix, the forming of a plaster mold from the set type of the book's page, the casting of a stereotype played from that mold, and finally, the sixth stage, the reverse impression of that stereotype plate made an ink on the paper that the reader was looking at in the end. These six steps summarize the mechanical processes necessary to print a book in 1832 using this new process of stereotyping. And here's part of that text. Uh, Babbage chose this example of new developments in type founding and printing technologies carefully. Uh, he wanted his readers to pause and to consider the hidden nature of printing and print culture in everyday life, and he wanted to highlight a significant new technological advance in an old artisan and new industrial practice, one that had always sought manufacturing consistency and the uniformity of output as its two primary measures of pride and accomplishment. The complex set of skilled industrial processes required to print a book 
were not usually noticed by the consumer who only judged the finished product against a world of similar printed matter. Machine parts and other objects of industrial manufacture, which he was most interested in, such as pieces of type and stereotype plates, had to be precise copies of one another in order to maximize manufacturing productivity and uniformity in output. Likewise, the advances in the printing trades that incorporated these new stages of copying, in effect complicating the manufacturing process, show how relatively soon after their adoption in the early part of the 19th century, something approaching perfection might be achieved, at least according to the printers and publishers who are bringing this stuff out, uh, perfection potentially applicable to all forms of industrial manufacturing. And it is significant to me and to this project that the third of Babbage's six stages here, this, uh, the point at which the mold makes a stereotype plate is where he says the union of the intellectual and the mechanical takes place. Okay, so um, a little bit of background on stereotyping and its, and its role in early uh, 19th century US printing and publishing, and then we'll get into Matthew Carey and really talk about the stereotype family Bibles. Uh, in this 30 year period between 1810 and 1840 roughly, uh, the printing trades and nascent publishing industry in the United States underwent a series of transformations that changed how books and other printed matter were created. Uh, these transformations changed notions of authorship and reading practices, and they began to break down an artisan-based model of printing and publishing that dated to the late medieval and early modern period. In a very short amount of time, one generation or two, the introduction of power presses, the adoption of stereotyping, which is printing from cast plates instead of standing type, the introduction of machine-made paper, and the growth and consolidation of local printers into regional and national publishers all took place and presented challenges and opportunities to the existing trade, the localized artisan craft practices of which had not fundamentally changed since the earliest days of European printing in the 15th century. All of these innovations became market ready, at least for some well-capitalized publishers uh, in this 30 year period. The most successful printers amassed capital, some of it in the form of stereotype plates, and secured wider distribution networks for their output, allowing them to be rightfully called publishers in the modern sense. Newly formed organizations like the American Bible Society immediately grasped the ways in which these innovations in speed, size, and reach could allow them to, to dramatically increase the scale and the impact of their mission to produce and distribute printed scriptures to the nation's citizens. The calculated growth and innovation of regional printing and publishing businesses during this time, together with their successes and failures, paved the way for the large scale nationally focused commercial publishing houses that would emerge in the United States by mid-century. So this book of which I'm gonna talk about a, a tiny slice today, uh, investigates that, the development and spread of stereotyping and its companion process, electrotyping, in the United States and primarily through the lens of book history and literary studies. Um, it argues that stereotyping was the most significant of these early 19th century innovations that helped create the large scale nationally based publishing industry in the United States by 1850. If a publisher made the right choice of title and followed the right business model, investing in stereotype plates could secure a greater market share and provide years of cheap reprints. If they chose to publish the wrong text, it could tie up significant amounts of money better used elsewhere. And as some local printers grew into regional and national publishers, the decision-making process about when and how to invest in this new technology became crucial to their growth and success. So my book explores some of these decisions, including several unsuccessful ones, which are very interesting. And by mining the archives of 19th century US printers and publishers, a more detailed picture emerges of individual reactions to technological change and disruption in the printing trades and of how American printing and publishing grew into the industry it is today. So a um, little, little bit more background. Uh, the Scottish book historian Aileen Fife has argued, and I agree that technological changes in the printing trades 
during the 19th century, are often alluded to in other works of book history and printing history, but exactly how they occurred on the ground is still little studied. And this book is an attempt to kind of open up that conversation a little bit more. Um, the introduction of an impact of stereotyping and, and electrotyping, for example, is mentioned in all the recently published national histories of the book in the United States and Britain and Canada and Ireland, and also in bibliographical manuals and other works on printing history. But the last full length monograph on stereotyping in the printing trades came out in 1941. And there are only a handful of, of scholarly articles on stereotyping in the past 40 years or so. So um, other disciplines could add contributions to a deeper study of stereotyping in the United States. So scholars in, in the field of American studies, which I, which I work in a little bit, have observed um, that there is a culture of uncritical technological positivism that pervades much of American history of technology. And they have argued that we need to increase interdisciplinary attention to what, what some scholars have called stories of technological stewardship and critiques of technology as both substance and ideology in American cultural life. And I subscribe to these, these inquiries um, very much so. And as this book is, is primarily concerned with the meanings that are generated um, by the introduction of newly invented physical objects, in this case, stereotype plates, into a long established profession, uh, objects that contain both textual and symbolic meanings, in addition to embodied capital, uh, it's important to consider this increased critical attention to how material objects resonate and create new interpretive meanings as individuals interact with them. Anthropological and historical studies of objects have become commonplace in the past couple decades. Um, the latter often group for better or worse into material culture studies, but objects and their meanings are also the subject of increased attention by literary scholars and cultural theorists. Uh, this is my attempt to look at the object as a, as a, as a form of inquiry with, related to, with relation to book history. So uh, my, this book then is necessarily influenced by critical studies in the history of technology. Uh, the printing historian Jessica Despain recently discussed the work of a film scholar named Rick Altman on what he calls the social interplay that occurs between the creation of a new technology and the human usage of them. Altman refers to this approach as crisis historiography which understands that the uses of technology by humans are both socially constructed, they are ongoing, and they are multiple. Uh, that is, the technology is never socially constructed once and for all. During a crisis, such as the introduction of printing plates into an established uh, universe of printers and publishers, uh, the technology is understood in varying ways, resulting in modification, not only of the technology itself, but also its terminology, exhibition practices, audience attitudes, and deeper meanings. Because the introduction of stereotype plates afforded printers new options for reprinting, investment, and expansion of their trade, the crisis they faced in the form of decisions on how best to employ plates and the texts they chose to have cast into plates fits well within this model. Um, the multiple ways in which printers and publishers under this, understood the significance of this new technology and its potential and limitations and how the understandings continue to evolve and change over time uh, drives the study. So this is as much a book about plates as it is about people and the decisions that these printers and publishers were making along the way in order to react to and understand and understand the ways in which they could leverage this, this new technology in new ways. So, um, Okay, so I am going to move into the topic at hand, and that's Matthew Carey and his work within the family Bible marketplace. So uh, in 1813, Matthew Carey owned the largest and best capitalized publishing firm in the United States. Um, this is him later in life, but um, he was, he was uh, born in Dublin, uh, Irish Catholic, Radical printer, publisher, editor, got into trouble twice with the colonial authorities in Ireland, fled to France once, where he settled in Passy, befriended Benjamin Franklin and Lafayette, 
who helped send him back to, to Ireland. He got into trouble again and finally was forced to emigrate to America in 17, um, 1784. And when he arrived in, in Philadelphia from New York, Lafayette was staying with George Washington at Mount Vernon at the time. And when he learned that this young Irish publisher who he had known in France was, was uh, establishing a business in, in Philadelphia, Lafayette sent him a check for 200 pounds to restart his business in the New Republic. And so with this near mythic start, Matthew Carey's long and successful career as a printer, publisher, philanthropist, reformer, and later political economist began in the United States, perhaps Philadelphia's second best known printer publisher um, from a later generation. Okay. Um, Carey published a magazine. He started uh, his own imprint in the 1790s, a uh, number of ventures, but by the mid 1790s, um, Carey let eight printers go and focused entirely on book selling and publishing, hiring local printers to complete jobs for him under his own imprint. And so um, as, as Jim Green, has remarked, Jim being the patron saint of book historians in Philadelphia, uh, quote, from 1794 on, Matthew Carey was more nearly a publisher in the modern sense than any American. Carey was well known in his own time as one of the few publishers to maintain complete works of texts set up in standing type, an extraordinary investment in materials and warehousing. Um, in the hand press period, Printing jobs were composed from loose type, set up into forms, corrected, proofed, and then printed from, all in a relatively short amount of time. Once the work was complete, the type was cleaned and then put back into its cases ready for the next job. This workflow, uh, producing many different books from the same fonts of type, was the most efficient for printing shops as type was a major investment and could not be added to easily without significant expense or tied up for long projects. Publishers also needed to estimate the demand and hence the size of an edition for a work in press, and then be prepared to hold on to printed copies for of it to sell in exchange for some time as the edition gradually sold out or until sufficient demand required a reprint. Editions of school books, geographies, and other works that were printed in the United States at this time would often not be reprinted for several years when the edition sold out finally of its initial print run. Um, Isaiah Thomas up in Worcester in Boston advertised in 1797 that he had four Bibles set up in standing type, a folio Bible, a royal quarto, a large demi octavo, and a demi duodecimo. Um, by 1803, Carey owned two complete Bibles set up in standing type, a quarto Bible, which is also known as a family Bible, which is the large lectern sized books that we probably all are all familiar with in which families recorded their births, deaths, and marriages. Uh, and he also had a duodecimo school Bible, pocket-sized uh, personal Bible set up in standing type, ready to be reprinted at will. He maintained a separate New Testament as well in standing type. Um, Carey innovated by selling Bibles by subscription in rural America through networks of traveling agents. And he also sold his family Bibles, especially in a variety of different options and prices on different papers and several choices of binding with or without maps, illustrations, commentary, and, and supplementary materials. Initially, some 20 different varieties ranging from a modest 375 up to $18, an extraordinary sum for a single volume in the 1810s. Uh, by 1810, Carey had essentially cornered the American market in Quarto family Bibles and would go on to be the foremost printer and publisher of the Bible in America in the first quarter of the 19th century. By 1813, he was offering about 50 different family Bible variants to the trade and for retail sale and for subscription. And here's a, here's a list from uh, Carey's catalog about 1813 showing um, 43 odd uh, options for choices on different papers, coarse paper, common paper, fine, super fine paper, found in calf and Morocco, uh, with apocrypha, with psalms, with plates, 11 plates, 25 plates. So the same Bible in standing type, 
just printed on different papers with supplementary material ranging from 375 all the way up to $18 or so. Uh, Matthew Carey knew about the European advances in creating stereotype plates well before the technology came to the United States. Accounts of stereotyping and advertisements for European stereotype works that were published in, Europe, in England and France began to appear in American newspapers as early as the mid-1790s. Um, in 1807, Carey copied into his personal memo book a letter from the English stereotyper Andrew Wilson to the New York printer John Watts, outlining the upfront costs for casting stereotype plates to books. Watts presumably showed the letter to Carey on one of his frequent business trips to New York around this time. And here's, here's part of that copied letter. Uh, Carey's response to the letter is not in the archives, He's, even though he saved copies of all his outgoing correspondence, nor is there any extant correspondence between him and either Watts or Wilson that I've been able to come, come up with. Um, this detailed cost breakdown by him came only four years after his first Bible and standing type was published, and it must have made a strong impression. If successful in the United States, a stereotyped work could be either a more efficient way of publishing a book or a direct challenge to Carey's business model. Uh, Carey would have also recognized that this new technology provided one way to circumvent the problem of keeping large quantities of valuable type tied up exclusively for one book and not put to more efficient use, especially for smaller publishers. Uh, in the letter, you can see about mm, most, most of the way uh, down, Wilson's condition of requiring payment for not stereotyping another copy of Johnson's dictionary for someone else, an effective de facto copyright here, raised an entirely new series of questions and challenges for publishers and type founders alike. Wilson demanded a significant sum, 282 pounds, to effectively grant one publisher sole access to the work that he had cast into stereotype plates. Once other English type founders began offering stereotyping services in their own shops, as they soon would do, Wilson's monopoly on Johnson's dictionary would end and he would have to compete in a marketplace of stereotypers for a publisher's business. When Watts first began creating stereotype plates in New York in 1813, which is where things really heat up, and other firms followed suit the following year, American publishing and type founding underwent the same changes that their English counterparts had a decade before. So beginning in 1813, several type founders in New York began experimenting with casting stereotype plates on their own from set type. Uh, they soon contacted the nation's prominent booksellers and publishers, including Matthew Carey, with offers of plates to Bibles and other popular works. Carey was offered copies of the first stereotype work in America, the Westminster Larger Catechism, pictured here, of which he purchased a large quantity and first examined a sample. Uh, Carey agreed to purchase 30 copies of the catechism on exchange from its printer, and Whiting and Watson, the publishers, sent him the first eight copies of this order, which reached Philadelphia and him on September 30th, 1813. And he now had copies of the first domestically produced stereotype book in hand to examine and also to sell. Perry was offered a set of plates to an octavo Bible from a New York type founder, and he eventually declined to purchase it around this time, but he countered with an inquiry about the cost of a New Testament instead. Um, the firm of D&G Bruce, who made the offer, replied to them in April 1814, I'm quoting here, we have the Testament in hand and would sell a set of plates at 225 per page, amounting to $756. Uh, we would allow 25% for your Old Testament on account if you would deliver it immediately as the value of metal must fall soon. Our Testament will be completed in July. And this is in April that they're writing. We have no scale of prices for stereotyping yet and do not intend to make a general business of it. That wasn't true. Uh, Carey agreed to purchase this set of plates to a New Testament and to supply the Bruces with his own New Testament in standing type 
as part of the purchase. So the complete New Testament, which is 336 plates, shipped from New York to Philadelphia in November of 1814. Carrie which charged $2.25 per plate, and, but he sent the Bruces a substantial quantity of old type from his standing type New Testament over the summer, valued at $421.88, leaving his out-of-pocket cost at about $334.12. Carrie, I think, did pretty well on the transaction, selling his old type to New York to the Bruces for their use during wartime to melt down and bringing his own actual unit cost for the New Testament plates down to almost exactly $1 per page. Kerry wisely printed one final impression from his standing type New Testament and warehoused it before he sent the type to the Bruces. Once he received his New Testament plates in the fall, he had no immediate need to print from them. Instead, they were warehoused and while he continued to sell printed copies of his final 1814 standing type impression. The following year, a firm of Collins and Company began to stereotype a complete quarto Bible. The firm was quick to announce this to the trade, both to claim the American precedent for a stereotype family Bible, and also to identify potential purchasers for its sets of plates. The Collinses wrote to February, wrote to Carey in February about it. Uh, they said, we do not expect to have any Bibles furnished for in under six months. We sincerely hope that we shall carry on the Bible business with a mutual good understanding, believing it necessary to ensure a mutual advantage. This mutual advantage they're referring to was the understanding that both Collins and Company in New York and Carey and Son in Philadelphia would now be competing for customers for their respective family Bibles. Collins was going to generate several sets of plates, but they were going to reserve one for themselves to print and sell. Um, Collins then wrote a long letter to Carey, stating in part, we have two sets of our stereotype quarto Bible cast and should be glad to sell thee one of them in preference to any other person in Philadelphia and Baltimore, as it would not then increase the printos of quarter Bibles in the United States. Would it suit thee to purchase and send one set to Pittsburgh or Baltimore? We shall probably sell to some bookseller south of thy city in the course of this year. Suppose thou reflects a little on this subject, the Collinses were Quakers, uh, and please drop us a line of mail, thy friends, Collins and company. With this courteous Quakerish threat to sell a set to a potential competitor of Carey's, Collins and company clearly hoped to push Carey to agree quickly to purchase one of these two sets of plates. And here's one of their announcements for that family Bible. Uh, the proposed Collins and Company Quarto Family Bible was not Carey's only competition. The marketplace was heating up. Isaiah Thomas already had a family Bible set up in standing type for the New England markets, and the Brattleboro, Vermont booksellers and publishers Holbrook and Fessenden imported a set of stereotype plates to a Quarto Bible from England in, in 1816. And from this set, the Vermont firm published an elegant illustrated family Bible by subscription for $12. In 1815, uh, the Bruces, also in New York, stereotyped and published their own New Testament, further cutting into Carey's business. Collins and company had issued a trade circular for their own stereotype quarter family Bibles early in 1815. And it used Matthew Carey's model of numbering each variant available with or without the notes, apocrypha, and plates on four different types of paper and with several different binding options. And here is the Collins and Company trade circular itemizing out their Bible variants. All told, 106 possible Cordo Bible variants were offered to booksellers and the publics by Collins. Uh, prices ranging from $1.62 for a coarse paper edition in sheets all the way up to 1850 for a super fine wove paper, ver paper version with the full complement of additional texts, engravings, in gilt calf, and with Mor Russian or Morocco bindings. Collins and Company's prices slightly undercut Carey's family Bible options for most of these variants if you compare them side to side. Carey's dominance in the family Bible marketplace was now seriously challenged, and the rapid changes taking place in typefounding and bookselling in New York at this time now made Philadelphia seem very far away from the center of innovation 
in the American printing trades in New York. In 1818, Benjamin Collins wrote to his brother Isaac that a letter had arrived from Matthew Carey inquiring about a set of plates for a family Bible. At long last, the letter came. Carey wanted to know how long it would take to cast and will you engage to cast but one set? Uh, Carey offered Collins half the cost of his own quarter Bibles and with, with discounts printed and perhaps on the standing type variant as well. Um, Collins answered each of Carey's questions and they wrote that it would take them about four months to cast the Bible. Carey could take deliverative in parts to print from as the plates were produced. Uh, Collins would, however, keep their own set of plates to this new setting of type, and they would not give Carey an exclusive license over the printing of it. The price for the Bible complete would be $4,500 for the Old and New Testaments and Apocrypha. Um, if Watts was doing the casting for them, as he had for his previous set of plates for Collins, the cost for this Bible and two copies represented a substantial savings in the unit cost of making a plate in America, down to about $400.50 a plate, down from $6 in only about three years. The technology was becoming more efficient, faster, and, uh, and the scale was increasing. Um, Carey refused Collins and Company's existing set of, of quarter plates and took about nine months to think about the response. Uh, at last, he, had, he seemed interested in acquiring this Bible for himself, this newly cast set of plates. Uh, they wrote and agreed to a deal. Uh, and so beginning in September 18th and continuing for several months, Carey's frequently correspondent, frequent correspondence with Collins in New York is concerned only with the specifics of the Bible setting and its production. Uh, and this is where the publisher's archives are really treasure troves of material. Um, HSP has all of Carey, Carey and Son, uh, Carey, Lee, and Febiger, and then Lee and Febiger's, the, all the successor firm's uh, papers, Carey's own personal papers, uh, and it's just an absolute treasure trove for printing history in America. Um, Carey kept letter books of all his outgoing correspondence. So we have both sets of incoming and outcoming, outgoing correspondence, which is again, just an absolute gem and a treasure trove. So over these months in 1818 and 1819, uh, Carey is giving Collins exacting instructions for setting up the work, specifying typefaces, sizes, and the layout for each part of the book. Um, his opinions would become even more exacting as the first page proofs began to arrive in Philadelphia for his examination. Carey was concerned with the headers and the notes and references within the text retreated. He complained frequently about the number of lines on each page and how the layout would not fit his stock, stock paper sizes. He conceded to giving up catchwords in the book to save one line per page, as Collins told them, thought them costly and of little use and especially for their tendency to become more quickly damaged as the plate with the catch word was stored and removed from its box to print from. To most of Carey's criticisms, Collins and company patiently explained the rationale and noted how certain types of changes would be impossible owing to the difficulty of correcting the plates once they were first cast. Additional lines of text, Collins said, could not be added to a plate so it would print evenly. And by the 1820s, correcting stereotype plates would become a more common practice. Uh, by late October 1818, about the first 250 plates were cast. Uh, in December, the first plates left Phil New York for, on a ship bound for Philadelphia. Twelve boxes, the first shipment containing about a fourth of Carey's Quarter Bible, along with the bill of lading for $1,100, were delivered. Uh, this would amount to about 24 plates housed in each small crate. The second shipment left in February 1819, a third shipment in March, and then the final shipment in May 1819. Carey paid cash, not, ex not on exchange for all four shipments, uh, including boxing and shipping for a total of $4,535.75 for his complete family Bible. Uh, Carey was taking some risk and paying so much for one set of plates, especially as they only gave him a duplicate text of his own standing type family Bible. But by owning the Philadelphia set of Collins's new Bible, he was able to prevent a third publisher from competing in the business. 
somewhere in the United States. The work was composed to his own standards as well. Collins's uh, earlier family Bible was already for sale in the Philadelphia bookstores. Um, publishers at this time claimed that stereotype editions had a greater degree of textual accuracy, even though this was not actually the case. But there was greater interest in, in them as being newer and more innovative. Carey could now claim that his Bible plates were the newest and the most accurate in the marketplace, surpassing Collins and Company's older edition that was then being sold in town. Skip two years forward to March 1821. Almost two years after receiving this final shipment of plates, Carey writes to Collins and Hannay, their successor firm, and he writes, quote, on examining the stereotype plates of the Quarto Bible, which we purchased from you, we find there are no blocks with them, which as usual, we presume you intend them to send. We request you to be so good to supply this deficiency. Um, Carey had essentially been warehousing these 50 boxes of stereotype plates to his Quarto Bible since the spring of 1819 and they apparently remained unexamined. And he continued to negotiate with them throughout the spring about the blocks, about the lack of an index to the Bible, which he had also assumed was included with the plates. Uh, and greater problems occurred that summer of 1821 when Carey requested um, six to eight pounds of pica type from them, quote, to correct the text of the stereotype Bible, which appears to have been very carelessly packed. Um, one week he later, he increased his request to 30 pounds of type. Uh, there being sundry battered and defectors letters in it. We are informed that some errors have been discovered in the Bible. Pray let us have immediate information of this that we may have them corrected before the edition is worked off. And then Collins replies that they had taken uh, proofs of every plate before boxing and sending them on. And so they had no knowledge of any improper fabrication. Um, Harry had been thinking about printing from the Bible plates for some time, but then it really took him two years of warehousing and not touching the boxes before he realized there were problems with them. Um, printer, publisher, type founder correspondence, especially when things go wrong at this er early period, is, are extremely entertaining. They're, are just um, and Kerry was 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 a very cranky man. His letters got increasingly uh, <laughs> uh, vehement as he encountered more and more problems, and and Collins was trying to assuage him and temper it a little bit. But they finally blew their top too and complained. So uh, let's see. Uh, here we go. As Carey began to make further preparations for bringing out this deluxe edition, he says, quote, a very large portion of the plates which we have received are unmerchantable. The injury we suffer from the delay which accrues out of this affair is very great. This of course, after having warehoused the plates for two years and not having looked at them. Collins agreed to send replacement plates where they were needed and to allow a third party to examine them to order and ascertain the state of the stage of repair. And these negotiations went on throughout the spring and summer of 1822, further postponing the publication of his Bible. They sparred continually uh, and the lowest point in the negotiations, Collins wrote a long anguished letter to Carey, itemizing all their disagreements and concluding, quote, we cannot pass over your letter of the third without indignation, that you should remark opposite 90 plates very bad and insinuate in a subsequent remark that they are so bad as to be irreparable is too insulting to our feelings to permit it being passed by in silence. Um, the repairs were made and the replacement plates were delivered to carry later that spring and summer. They, three days later, they sent a more temperate letter agreeing to the, to the corrections and apologizing. Um, this experience, of correcting his damaged Bible plates caused delay, uh, a delay of a full year for Carey to bring out his first stereotype family Bible. He finally published the edition in 1823, four years after taking ownership of the plates. It would be the only stereotype Bible that Carey and Son printed and its successor firms as well. Um, Carey and Son would also print one final impression of the family Bible from standing type the following year uh, after the stereotype edition. 
By this time, the United States family Bible market was completely different from the one that Kerry had dominated earlier in the century. Many competitors across the country were now publishing similar or cheap editions, and the American Bible Society was successfully carrying out its mission to distribute inexpensive copies of the Bible to all parts of the United States, uh, and sometimes for free. Kerry and Son would abandon the Bible business entirely in 1824. And from there, I'll stop. There are many more anecdotes, but I think I will stop there and stop sharing my screen. Thank you. This is very interesting. I don't know if uh, we're all aware of the um, how high stakes the publishing industry was even, uh, even in the early 19th century. This is very interesting. Uh, I invite anybody who have your questions, please put them in the chat or the Q&A. We're going to start with one from Carol Ann, wondering if these various Bibles uh, that you were talking about that, that Matthew and the other publishers has created different types of Bibles, did they have different illustrations or were the illustration plates always the same? Um, there were variants. There were unillustrated cheap Bibles, pocket Bibles, and there were fancy illustrated Bibles. And um, the illustrations to, to, the, to the Bible in the West have been copied and recopied by engravers and re-engraved you know, many times over. So this, you see the same general scene or passage uh, illustrated in similar ways. And you can trace the, the variants of those back hundreds of years practically. So yes, and as you saw from the, from the, um, the itemization of Carey's variants and then Collins's variants, you would have to pay extra for the engravings if you so chose. And uh, Carl, I, I was fascinated. I felt like this is sort of like now when you go to get a couch or a mattress, like there's 101 different varieties and you can get totally mm -hmm. just overwhelmed. Or a car. <laughs> The, or a car, the options that you want, all the, yeah, all, all the add on options is just family. fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, so, Carlos is wondering if there were certain typefaces that were more popular than others in early stereotyping. Um, there wasn't a stereotyping specific typeface, it was just all the common typefaces that were used at that time in, in early 19th century America. So, plenty of Caslon. Because what were some of the, do you, I mean, not to put you on the spot, but if, if you know, was some of the ones that were the most popular in early uh, years? Well, the Philadelphia firm of Binney and Ronaldson was, was casting type that when they were sending their types all throughout um, the country. So um, uh, many printers simply just asked for a book type in a specific size. They would write and send me, you know, send me 10 pounds of, of pica or bourgeois, which is how they pronounce bourgeois, which were the, was the size of the type. So um, yeah, there, there wasn't a terrible amount of typeface innovation um, until much later in the, in, the, in the 19th century. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so Scott notes that your Babbage introduction was spot on. He says, you might have added that a key and often overlooked innovation of Babbage's analytical engine was producing plates of his of its computations that could go directly to the press. And mm -hmm. his was used primarily to compute mathematical tables, which were well known to accumulate errors when hand set. So creating mm -hmm. the plates directly avoided these errors. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I found it fascinating that Babbage was writing about plates right when he was starting to think about ways of improving mechanical innovations in industrial practices, steam powered or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, me mechanical manufacturing processes. So I, I'm just happy to pull Babbage and, and the difference engine <laughs> uh, by default back into, back into the project because he was aware of it. That's interesting. And it would make sense obviously with, with, uh, with mathematical equations you are more likely to make mistakes. Um, so that, that's interesting. Um, both Jean and Claudia have similar questions or twinned questions, I think, about, about the nature of, of the plates. Um, well, uh, Jean notes, uh, thanks for the fascinating explanation of the shift from movable type to stereotyping, and wondering if you can explain exactly how the stereotype plates were created. Mm -hmm. As far as the paper between 1800 and 1820, this was still handmade, right? And who did Kerry get his paper from at that time? Are there records of that? Hmm. So, so um, plates were made from a form of standing type. So you set up your page in standing type and lock it into a form. 
and there's a cast there was a, um, a mold made in plaster of Paris initially there was there's a couple different variants there's a French method and then an English method um, the Americans all went to to England and, and followed Lord Stanhope's um, uh, English method and they would basically make a mold out of plaster of Paris with a little layer of powdered graphite in there for a proper release and your plaster of Paris mold would then be used to make a casting um, uh, with hot metal and you get a thin plate that you would then have to break the plaster of Paris out of. Um, mm -hmm. Only later on they started to innovate and use a, um, a paper mache, papier mache kind of mold, you know, like today's flong, if you've seen newspaper flong into the 20th century. Um, but initially it was a plaster of Paris mold and the plumbago or graphite industry in America took off as a result of stereotyping and electrotyping. So uh, John Thoreau and his, his son, Henry David's firm of pencil making quickly shifted in the 1830s to supplying powdered graphite to the, the stereotyping and electrotyping trade in the Boston area. And their family wealth arose, not just from pencil making, but also from supplying industrial powdered graphite to the mm -hmm. printing trades. Um, Henry David created a method for grinding graphite into a powder in the yellow of their family house where they kept their shop. So but I'm, I'm diverging. Uh, and then paper making. Yeah, um, paper making was both handmade and machine made at this period. Um, the first um, um, industrial paper making was, was I think realized in New England, probably around 1818, I think. So before that it was all handmade. Uh, and there were paper mills, you know, wherever you had um, proximity to the, to the printing trade. So there were some outside of Philadelphia, some outside of New York, and some outside of Boston up in New England um, making handmade paper in America from the, from the late 18th century. But the machine made paper started to come in, let's say by 1820 or so. And then Claudia is uh, curious when we talk about creating the plates, uh, she said because of their size and weight, they probably, it seems like they pose storage challenges. So how were they stored? They posed storage challenges, but they posed better or potentially more safer storage challenges than storing a large quantity of printed stock unbound on paper uh, for warehousing. You know, you didn't have the risk of fire, obviously, and your whole investment in your whole stock going up. And so uh, you know, when Harper and, and brothers famously built their new headquarters in, in New York in 1853, after their big fire, they created massive underground stereotype fireproof vaults, which they stored their sets of plates and warehouse them in boxes and then could call them up anytime they wanted to. So uh, weight was an issue and certainly transport in the days before railroads and efficient transport was a very big problem. Um, getting those plates from New York to Philadelphia required boats and carriages and all sorts of potential places where plates in crates slotted in could get damaged in transit. Um, there was a should say there was a, um, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the American publishers got together every year and, and had celebrations at the trade sales in New York and Boston and Philadelphia. And there was a, a Reverend E.H. Chapin who gave a toast at one of these publishers banquets in 1855. And he said, I'm quoting here, why sir, in this very city, there is buried treasure, treasure underground, not diamonds, not ingots, a treasure worth far more than any said to have been hid by Captain Kidd, genii imprisoned in little boxes that at the beck of the publisher start out with a power more potent than that of the spirit described in the Arabian tale. You know, he's toasting the, the huge quantity of capital in the form of stereotype plates that the American publishers are warehousing in the vaults and their sub sub basements of their printing shops all throughout the city. That's a great, that's a great quote. Um, so I'm gonna do one more question about the stereotyping and then we have some questions on other topics. So Marty is wondering over what time period stereotyping uh, came to dominate book publishing in the US and Europe and when publishers may have stopped mentioning stereotyping in the title pages. Um, it, was, it was a gradual innovation in book publishing and then later magazine publishing. Um, in, in this period, but still not exclusive. Um, books were still being printed from standing type 
by major American publishers in the 1850s, even though that was beginning to be not, not the case. Um, Harper and Brothers, they started out as J&J &J Harper, two brothers, and then they added two more. They sort of had a business model in the 1830s that they would stereotype every single book they produced. They wouldn't pick and choose, but they would do that as an investment to be able to, and their magazine as well, to be able to um, sort of amass that. But other places, other firms like, um, like Tickner and Fields in Boston were still um, publishing Hawthorne Scarlet Letter um, in two separate settings of standing type in the eight, mid 1850s before they finally invested in a set of plates to the book. So it took a while for, for it to become the most viable business model for every publisher. And then later the magazines um, and, some, and some larger newspapers started to realize the effects of size and scale. So if you could generate multiple pages of a magazine or a newspaper, you could put them on multiple presses at the same time. And then you know, the London Times was you know, printing multiple copies of its newspaper overnight 100,000 copies in 1850 or so and being able to distribute them all, all throughout Great Britain, you know, because of the, sh the simple, the, the sense of scale when you can have multiple sets of plates being printed on multiple power presses at the same time. Interesting, so speaking of scale, you know, we talked about the Bibles, it makes sense for Bibles to have been the early, you know, books to be done on stereotype because there was a, a large um, and, and, and steady business for them. Um, but Ingrid's wondering if there were other popular titles that were an important part of the stereotype trade. Yeah, absolutely. And they were, as you might expect, the sort of steady sellers that a publisher could return to time and time again without having to update or correct uh, on a yearly basis, like an, like an almanac wouldn't, wouldn't be a good choice. But a school book, a textbook, a grammar, um, dictionaries, that sort of thing, were, were far and above the, the sort of the best things. And of course, the stability of a religious text, be it a catechism or, or scripture, was, was the perfect candidate for those sort of steady reprints. Um, and there are plenty of examples of um, uh, um, English and German and French grammars being reprinted for 40 odd years as the plates are bought and sold as commodities down to sort of increasingly down market publishers as the plates get worn and um, additions get new editions of, of different texts come out. But there's a, they have a long afterlife and for the right text to be set into plates, um, it could have a very long afterlife and multiple owners and multiple reprints over multiple decades. Um, so uh, Michael is curious that you briefly showed the plates for Mary Baker Eddy's Science and Health and wondering oh, where this uh, set, do you know where this set survives? Yeah, I'm, I'm, bl I'm blanking. I think it's in Chicago. Um, and there, there are a number of, there are a couple sets around the country that I've seen that still have some of the original boxes intact like that. Um, there are plenty of individual plates, mostly Electro's. Um, from, from the turn of the century or the early 20th century that are out there on eBay, but a complete set. Um, I think it's at the University. I think it's the University of Chicago that is, has that set. It's interesting. And uh, Mary Frances, um, you, you know, you showed the, uh, the larger catechism of the Westminster Confession, um, which was the first stereotype book published in the United States, wondering if it reached Philadelphia churches. Hmm. I don't, Kerry only sold them in his retail bookshop from what I, I can remember. I don't think he had a, he, he sold an order of them uh, to any of the churches for their use or for, for, for a, a bulk order like that. So I don't think so, um, but. That'd be very like, if it's in his bookstore, then it's very likely some of the Presbyterian pastors and, and elders in the area would have hmm. purchased from him. Um, so Gaynor is wondering when the later electroplating process was introduced. Mm -hmm. um, by the 1840s and 50s, um, even earlier, um, electrotyping was seen as a, oh, a slightly more efficient way. It was a little bit less messy in a different way than having to deal with plaster of Paris or paper mache. You submerge your form of type into a vat of a copper solution and you pass electrodes through it and overnight the copper atoms adhere in a very fine way to the surface of the type. 
giving you a reverse, a reverse impression that acted as your mold. Um, so electrotyping really took over um, as the dominant book uh, form of making or casting plates. I just shorthand and say stereotyping because it's, uh, it's easier. And also the point of time I'm working on right now is really the early days of the first two decades, 18 teens and 20s when it was the, the dominant technological form. But by the, by the end of the 19th century, everything is basically electrotyping, of course. And uh, Anthony wonders if the plates were made of lead, um, he imagines it was a dangerous process and did, wondering if they knew about the dangers of working with lead, lead poisoning. I, I think to some extent, uh, maybe not to, to the knowledge we know of it today, but, um, it, and it's significant that the first people who are casting plates were type founders. Um, they were people who had the, the skill and wherewithal to work with, with hot metal uh, and alloys and find the right degree of hardness or softness in different alloys um, to, to do that. Um, the, um, the French firm of Didot had, uh, in the 1790s, they had a really hard um, alloy that they used for their casting of their plates. And they would sort of make a, make a physical impression into a copper plate with this hard type that you couldn't do with, with normal printing types either. So there are all sorts of innovations going, well, actually, well, going back to the 15th century of people trying to form different ways of casting plates from set type or of set type. Um, the Dutch, um, some scholarship has shown that the have been doing some sand casting of letter forms rather than individual letters. And that continues out to the 17th and 18th century. I should say being in Philadelphia that Benjamin Franklin did discuss the, uh, the idea of casting plates from set type or, may, or just making plates, though it, he never was able to carry it out, but he, he maintained some correspondence with it as well. So there's a, and throughout printing history in the West anyway, there's a long history of these attempts and it was finally successfully realized in Britain and America in the 1790s for the most part. I have two quick questions left. Um, one, several people are wondering if you can tell the difference um, easily between a stereotype versus typeset or other um, methods of, of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, uh, typesetting or mm -hmm. publishing. And also if there were uh, any publishers that were better known than Carrie at Philadelphia in the time, or was he the mm -hmm. best known? Um, well, I'd say during the time I've been talking about, Carrie was definitely the, the dominant force of Philadelphia publisher, publishing and printing, definitely. He had a bookshop, he had his big outreach, he had his his network. He was he was definitely the the man in Philadelphia at this time. But no, looking at a single page impression of type printed type, you couldn't tell whether it was printed from standing type or stereotype plates. Um, but if you are able to put five different um, impressions or editions of a novel side by side over five decades and compare the setting of the type, then you might be able to. Um, make a reasonable assumption that it was printed from plates rather than printed type, especially if a plate gets nicked, you know, a letter E on page 10 uh, has a little bit taken out of it, and then that gets reprinted 10 years later in a different edition of that same novel. You put them side by side and you can pretty much then start to figure out, okay, this, this must have been printed from the same set of plates. Um, over different ownership and over different time. But just looking at it, no, that's, it's, it's completely transparent and invisible. And that's why these publishers early on would, would put um, stereotype edition to advertise the newness, the technological innovation, the fanciness. Um, and oftentimes the stereotyper would be given also some credit. And that gradually dissipated by the late 1820s when it started to become kind of the norm. Thank you. Thank you. There have been so many questions um, and we're hitting right up on the top of the hour now. Um, we thank you, Jeffrey, for this talk, for teaching us so much. Um, you could probably give us a talk for every day for, for the next week or two and we still would be just barely mining the depths of the, the, the publishing industry. I know one question I always want to ask you was during this, I was thinking what was the most surprising or interesting thing that you found in, in Carrie's papers, but we may have to bring you back to talk about oh, him a bit more. There's so much, and there's so much, <laughs> they're really wonderful. They're, they're uh, again, having both sides of the set of correspondence is, makes all the difference because you're able to actually trace um, this, this 
these things unfold and see the process unfold of ordering and supplying and where problems happen and everyone starts to complain about each other. It's just, it's just a wonderful picture. You know, Kerry was plugged in to New York as much as he was plugged into all the marketplaces on the West and the South where he had his influence. And it all comes back and comes through his, through his, um, through his office and he writes about it. Well, thank you. And I invite everybody to come. Um, our, our next programs upcoming are in person, including next Wednesday, the 26th. We have um, Dr. Guthrie Ramsey here at 6 p.m. to talk about um, who hears here on Black music past and present, the uh, long playing histories of Black musical innovation, which should also be another treat for us. Um, on the 27th in the afternoon, we have Dr. Lily Cass giving us a taste of uh, Opera Philadelphia's upcoming opera, La Boheme, um, and then a bunch of wonderful things coming in May, including Carrie Ricky bringing back our movie matinees, looking at film noir um, um, starting on May 1st with Out of the Past with Robert Mitchum and Kirk Douglas, and that will be a great way to get out of the hot weather. So we look forward to seeing all of you again soon. Thank you so much, Jeffrey McCullough, for a wonderful talk and hope next time your research or adventures bring you to Philadelphia that you will come to the Athenaeum. We'd love to welcome you here in person. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Beth and Tess and everyone. It's been great to be here. Thank you.